first of all, Lent is not something I grew up really uh, thinking a whole lot about. Um, but uh, I, I think of our, our Irish Catholic priest over this way, Michael Doyle, he, he had a great line. He said, uh, what's the difference between a flute and a stick in the mud? And he said, a stick in the mud is still full of itself, but a flute has been emptied of itself so it can make beautiful music in the world. And, you know, he did that as an invitation to think of Lent as a season where we can, uh, uh, you know, think about, do some inward work and, and really uh, empty ourselves to be filled up with the spirit of God and renewed for a new year. Uh, so I like that image. And Katie and I, my wife and I have a Lenten practice which is turning off our lights and going old school Amish with oil lamps. And so we've got candles and oil lamps and we kind of unplug uh, after like five o'clock, you know, so you got these early evenings, but it, it causes us to slow down and to spend time together and talk. It's kind of like we're sitting around the fire, you know, all night or night. And <laughs> But I, I grew up in Tennessee. I uh, that's why I've got my charming Southern accent. And I fell in love with Jesus in the Bible Belt. Uh, and um, I grew up Methodist, actually. And, and I, you know, but then I got involved in the Pentecostal movement. I started, you know, being really inspired by Mother Teresa and, and the Catholic tradition. So I've got kind of all these different fusions of uh, different streams of Christianity that have shaped me. Um, and there's always the bones to spit out a little bit, but uh, it was when I was in Philadelphia, I came to Eastern University, I studied sociology, and I really like how Karl Barth said, we need to read the Bible in one hand, but we need to read the newspaper in the other, so that our, our faith doesn't just become a ticket into heaven and a license to ignore the struggling world that we live in right now. So that's why I love studying the Bible in one hand and studying sociology in the other, um, also where I got to know uh, the beloved uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris. We were student organizers in Philly. Um, and this is wild. Uh, this, going back to the 1900s, I've been in Philadelphia now for uh, 25 years. This is the 25th anniversary of The Simple Way, the little community that I've been a part of and started that, you know, uh, organizing right here on the north side of Philly with Reverend Liz Theo Harris and a lot of other great folks that are still dear friends uh, after a few decades. And what is the, uh, so speaking, thinking about, you know, pairing those two things, your organizing work, um, what is the prophetic and like justice seeking work that you're doing in the world right now? Why are you compelled to engage in this work? What impact are you trying to have on the issues of injustice of our day? I, I, I like how um, G.K. Chester, Chesterton, when he was asked about, you know, what's the biggest problem in the world? Uh, he said, I am. <laughs> and he kind of said that to real, you know, you know, to to recognize that some of this work as far as transforming the world begins by, you know, looking in the mirror and trying to root out the hypocrisies and contradictions in our own heart. And um, so uh, as one of my mentors says, uh, that's why we can say when people say that the church is full of hypocrites, we can say, no, it's not. We've always got room for more. <laughs> that we're, you know, we're trying to work uh, to be more faithful ourselves. So, I mean, I, I, I like to think that we're, we're trying to do that. You know, uh, to have a light footprint on the earth right here. We, we've got, you know, backyard chickens and grapevines and compost and uh, rainwater recycling, and you know, we're, we're got community gardens and all that stuff going, um, and. It's also, I think, out of this place um, in North Philadelphia that uh, a lot of our, the urgency for change um, becomes kind of a fire in our bones, you know. Um, so our community started with the courageous, prophetic uh, action of poor and homeless families in Philadelphia, mostly mothers and children that had moved into an abandoned Catholic church building uh, just around the corner from here. And they uh, were being evicted from that. And uh, sadly, the church said, you're trespassing on abandoned Catholic church property, you know, and uh, the families hung a banner that said, uh, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? And they held a press conference and said, uh, 
we mean no disrespect to the Catholic officials, but we've talked to the real owner of this building. <laughs> the, the Lord Almighty and God. There you go. Today, you know? and, and so that, that, you know, that's how things started for us. And over the years, you know, the, the issues kind of surface out of our, our, our place and our present, you know, our presence here. So we've seen way too many kill uh, people killed from gun violence um, in the, in the pandemic over the last two years, gun violence became the number one cause of death of American children. So higher than car accidents or cancer, anything else is, is, is uh, guns are, are taking the lives of our children. That's why we say we can't be pro-life and ignore the epidemic of gun violence. Uh, and it was when a 19 year old was killed, you know, in front of our house that I, I think that's when for me, um, I really resonated with Dr. Martin Luther King when he said, we're all called to be the good Samaritan and lift our neighbor out of the ditch. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to say, we need to rethink the whole road to Jericho. We got to do something about why people keep ending up in the ditch, or in this case, why people keep, you know, uh, dying on our streets. So in the midst of all that, um, we believe in that, that, you know, prophetic action that we uh, I sometimes say we're not just protesting, we're protestifying. We're proclaiming that, you know, the world can be different, that this doesn't have to be normal. Uh, so one of the things that we've been doing lately over, over the past few years is inspired by the prophets, Micah and Isaiah, when they talk about beating swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks. So um, I don't know if people are watching or listening, but I have a few visuals here of our this is a, a shovel that we made out of uh, a gun. So the tools made from the gun and even the the wood handle is made from the stock of the gun. Uh, we're making these plows and hand tools. Um, and every, I, sometimes I tell my, my evangelical friends that this is what a gun looks like when it gets born again. <laughs> you know, because we're declaring, you know, all things can be made new. And just as metal, can you know metal that's designed to kill can be recrafted to cultivate life um, rather than to destroy it? Um, people can be uh, made new. You know st our streets can be made new. Our country can be made new. So we kind of declare that. And uh, one other thing that we've been doing recently is we we find sadly you know way too many of these bullet casings on our streets. Um, so we take the brass casings of the bullets. Um, I mean, we've got a whole um, jar of them and we melt them down into uh these little brass hearts you know and, and it's that that kind of holy work of declaring that um that things can be made different and and i i think of the words of uh you know as you th as we think about the prophetic um walter brueggemann who's been a dear friend and inspiration in this work he he wrote the book the prophetic imagination and he says sometimes we 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 misunderstand the prophets we think we think of them like they were fortune tellers you know that they're trying to predict the future but that's not quite it and he says that the, the prophets weren't trying to predict the future they were trying to change the future and they weren't fortune tellers they were truth tellers so they're trying to shake us right and wake us up to the way that we're living right now and the future that we're headed towards and say, it doesn't have to be this right way, right? We we don't have to live with masses of our human population in desperate poverty while a, hand, a, hand, a handful of people have more than they can ever imagine, you know? We don't have to uh, uh, live in a country where we're losing 110 lives every day to gun violence. Um, so I think that that idea that change comes um, from the people of God, you know, I mean, that that beautiful text in the prophets where it says they'll beat their swords into plows. It said it ends by saying nation will not rise up against nation and they will and people will study violence no more. But what's interesting is that peace doesn't begin with the politicians and the presidents and the kings. Uh, peace begins with the people who literally begin to make change happen. They take it into their own hands and they say, we refuse to kill. We refuse to continue to live into the patterns of violence that are killing us. And the politicians will follow the people. So I think it's a, a beautiful invitation to realize that uh, the world doesn't have to be this way. And sometimes we might be waiting on God while God is waiting on us to take action.
faith and hope can be difficult. I know for me personally, it can be difficult. Um, but thinking about, you know, I've been thinking about how, how hope isn't necessarily tethered to the future. What you were talking about with the, you know, thinking about, you know, our prophets, not just like, you know, uh, telling what the future is, but shaking us up in this moment now, like in this moment now with, with hope tethered to the current moment, like what gives you hope? And then from that, um, looking forward like what can you look forward to with like this like hopeful faithful uh expectation but it's not some kind of wishful thinking it's not you know it's really tied to the present moment yeah there's a beautiful scripture about that right that that who hopes for what they already see but we hope for something different something more and i think that's where faith comes in you know as as a uh a friend of mine often says um faith is believing despite the evidence and watching the evidence change. So before every social movement that changed the world, you know, the fall of apartheid, the um, fight for women's rights, the uh, fight for abolition and for civil rights, like before that social movement, everybody said it's impossible. And in hindsight, everybody looked back and said it was inevitable, but it wasn't inevitable, right? History doesn't just happen, history's made. And I think that's why, you know, when, when we're living right now, we're living in a time where where we have an opportunity to, um, participate with God to write the future. And that that's why I believe despite the evidence, you know, and I, because I think that's, that's what the prophetic invitation has always been. Um, and, uh, um, and I, I've always loved that old hymn, uh, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. And we often say hope to, you know, this hope that I have, the world didn't give it to me, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. So we know this story. Right? We know what we've been through, what we've survived, and we know that God is with those who are suffering, uh, and God has never left us. And and so I, you know, I, I even think uh, we we hope differently. You know, our our hope is not in uh, Wall Street. Our hope is in a God who's near to the suffering and the poor. And our, our you know, the the real indicator of how healthy our society is 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 not how the stocks are doing. But how the the least of these, as Jesus called it, the the most vulnerable vulnerable people among us, how are they doing? That's the real litmus test for you know how we're doing as a society. So, every, anywhere I'm around people who it would seem like they have, have every reason to be hopeless, they're the most hopeful people I've ever seen because their hope isn't in all of this stuff. You know, uh, as as the old hymn goes, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So uh, there's all other ground is sinking sand. So there's a lot of people that are putting their hope in a political party or a political candidate. But I think one of the radical things about Christian hope is our hope is in Christ alone and all this other stuff is sinking sand. You know, the discipline of fasting is closely connected with a feeling of resistance, both from within as well as from without. And Jesus faced resistance from the religious elite, Rome, his family, even his disciples from time to time. How have you handled a resistance from others? What internal resistance have you experienced in the face of hardship? Well, I I never like it when people are mean or frustrated. <laughs> I don't know, something about how I'm wired. I just like for people to you know, find the best in each other. Um, but one of my mentors who's had plenty of pushback, he said, uh, you know, there's, there is that scripture that says, woe to you when people speak well of you, because that's what they said of the fa false prophets, you know, <laughs> and Jesus, of course, says if people, you know, are upset with you, um, take courage, look at how they treated me, look at what they did to me. So, you, you know, you, 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 you love real good and you get beat up real bad sometimes. But I think I, you know, I look at the prophets. I look at the people that I um, uh, like Dr. King and, and uh, Rosa Parks and, you know, uh, Ida B. Wells and so many others throughout history that have lived um, these courageous lives and, um, and they, they've suffered persecution from it. So I almost wonder if we don't have some sort of pushback, are we imagining uh, a different future and a different world? Are we pushing back against uh, the principalities and powers enough? And I always say, though, it's important who's frustrated um, because it, Jesus, uh, Jesus, the people who were so upset with Jesus were the self-righteous religious people. 
And those are the folks that Jesus says harshest words. He called a brood of vipers. And he said, you travel land and sea across the world to make a single convert. And then you make them twice the son of hell that you are. <laughs> and he, you know, he said to the folks ostracized from the religious community, you know, to the tax collectors and the prostitutes, you know, and the folks on the fringes of the faith, he said, um, you know, that you're, he said, you're coming into the kingdom of, of God ahead of the religious folks, you know? So, I mean, this, this is, so everything's backwards. So I, I always want to be sensitive to, you know, are we frustrating the people that Jesus frustrated? And is our gospel good news to the poor and to the hurting? Uh, and I think that makes, you know, a really big difference. And my goal is never to like take anybody off, but I do think that there's self-righteous folks that, um, uh, uh, you know, on both the left and the right that are, are can be pretty, pretty uh, mean. And there's a lot of virtual activists and virtual theologians these days that have a lot of time on their hands and plenty of <laughs> energy to critique. But uh, yeah, at the, the end of the day, I, I think we, we try to be faithful, no matter whether it wins us an award or gets us put in jail. And to be honest, I've had both of those happen. <laughs> so we just try to be faithful, you know, uh, no matter what the outcome, to be more concerned with um, are we doing what's right, um, whether people notice or not. You know, we have a song that we sing in the Poor People's Campaign, uh, before this campaign fails, we'll all go, down, all to go down to jail. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and then it made me think of uh, the wonderful words of Betty Mae Fikes uh, singing like, up over my head, I see freedom in the air. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I really do believe, I said, I really do believe a change is coming. And so, you know, a change is coming. So in thinking about this Lenten season, um, it, are there any last words, closing words that you'd like to share with everybody today? Well, I mean, this is just, it's such a gift to be a part of this conversation, to be a part of the Poor People's Campaign in Kairos. I mean, we've done so much stuff over the years and we have gone to jail uh, many, many, many times, more than I could tell. I used to have a little thing I would, put on my wall that it can, I, I'd lost track, but I, you know, I, I, uh, I think of Dr. King, I've been, you know, I, I get a lot of courage from Dr. King and Miss Coretta Scott King. And I, I, I think, you know, that first time he went to jail, he said, uh, I was a little troubled to go to jail, but then I looked at history and I saw what good company I have. <laughs> that's why, you know, John Lewis can say, that's why we can smile in our mug shots. Cause we know that we're on the right side of history. So it's always um, a gift to have a conversation like this with the Kairos community, the Poor People's Campaign. And um, it's always uh, a gift to show up together, you know, uh, when it's the, the right time to, to do the good trouble and um, to uh, try to stand on the right side of history. So I'm grateful. Yeah.